So today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be starting with a little bit of math and then we're going to go from there into elephants. Why? Why math? Because it has everything to do with elephants. And the um, here I've got I've got um, I when I'm teaching my daughters how to to do mathematics. I've, I've, I've been getting all these different manipulatives and things for us to play with. So we got a set of like the counting cubes and the tens things and the plates of hundreds and the blocks of thousands. And so this is one of my little ones units. All right. And this is so this is one. Right. And it has an area of one. Okay. So there's one cube inside this cube. And let's look at how many sides it is. So you know cubes, like think of a dice. How many sides does it have? Right? Um, so this, this one little cube, it's got six sides. And so that means that the, the um, that's, 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 that's cool. But it's going to get a lot more interesting in just a moment. But is everybody with me? We have a unit of one with six sides. Okay, hold on to your hat because um, let's get my visualizer on here. All right, so here's one. Now, if I double, if I double the size of this cube, intuitively, how much have I increased the, the area of it? Um, so if I double the size of this cube, um, sort of when we think about that intuitively, we think, well, if it's going to double, you're going to double. So if you double the size of this, you double the area of it. Well, let's find out. Because if I double the size of it, that means instead of a length of one, it's going to have a length of da -da -da two. All right. So if that's its length, then that's its width. And... That means on the ground floor, it's got four. And now I am going to build that up. Oh, look at that. Ah! I have, look at that. I doubled the size of it. And now the area of this, the, the, sorry, not the area of it, the volume of this, the volume of my little friend here has gone from being one to eight. And can anybody figure out what this, um, so we, we, we doubled it, we went from one to eight. Now, if I triple the size of it, all right, then it gets even bigger. And so I'm going to triple the size of this. See if you can figure out what the volume is going to be. So volume, I don't know if I was saying area at the start, but pretend I wasn't. Because so the area, the, sorry, the, the volume of this is one. The volume of when we doubled it, we got ourselves all the way to eight. And now I'm tripling it. And look at all these blocks that I get to play with. Wow. Um, so as I am changing the size, there are some interesting, interesting things that that are, are, are happening. So if I started, if I started with, um, let's say I had, this was 
uh, times one, this was times two, this was magnified, this was increased three times. I'm gonna do this larger, let's try that so that it shows up better. All right, so we have times one, we have times two, and we have times three. And what is the volume? Um, on this one, I started off with a volume of one. If I double the size of it, my volume went up to eight. And what did, uh, what, what happened when I come here? Let's see, there's on each side, there's on each level, there's, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And there are three layers now of this nine. So nine times three, we've got a volume of 27 in there. We, we, we increased the linear dimensions of this by three and we went up from one to 27. So as I am increasing the size of it, the volume is going up by the cube. So my volume is going up faster than my linear dimensions. And this is huge. This is huge. Um, if you've ever seen one of these movies with, um, you know, the attack of the giant ants um, or giant spiders uh, you know, knocking down buildings, um, uh, the attack of the 50 foot man um, or giants running around. Giants, they kind of look like sort of, you know, big boned people in movies. But um, if you took a person and um, if you took an ant, um, here's, here's, I'm going to bounce back to the jack cam again for a second. If you, uh, like ants, uh, they're, they, they've got a really short generation time. They're really strong. They've got these great colonial structures. If you grew that an ant up to the size of a bulldog, it would be absolutely terrifying. So what's wrong with this plan? Why aren't ants the size of a bulldog or, or the size of a Clydesdale or larger? Why are ants the size of an ant? Well, the reason is that is this scaling thing that we're looking at here. As you get bigger, the, um, as you get larger and larger and larger, you're getting heavier faster than your linear dimensions are growing. So if you take something that works on a small scale and you just scale that up, if you had an enlarging machine and went on the little ant out there, and now it's the size of a Rottweiler, and it goes like, oh man, I'm an ant, hear me roar. And it comes after you, it takes a step and it would break its own little leg by the weight of its own body. That only works at that small scale. So as you get something really big, you have this incredible weight burden and it's disproportionate to the size of your bones. So if you like were to put me in the growing machine and I tried to stand up, there's now so much weight on my bones. I would stand up, I would break my own bones under my own weight. And that is one part of the science of scaling. So the idea of being big, you're, it doesn't work to take the small thing and make it big. So all those, you know, fast moving giant insects in the movies. Like you ever seen a big insect? Think of the biggest insect that you've seen. It's going like, hello, <laughs> we get a little bit bigger. <laughs> We're gonna have even more problems here, right? That's a system that works on the small scale. And the same thing with vertebrates. Like so you take a vertebrate and you make it bigger. You can't just <laughs> scale it up, right? 
You try to do that. And the, the same thing if you're trying to build a house. You can't just take a small house. You make the small house bigger, it will collapse under its own weight. Because with as you're as you're going up, you're you double the size, you have cubed the amount of creases. So if you made the size 50 times bigger, you're cubing the 50. You're now really, 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 really big. But wait, there's more because we're going to just jump back to this little cam here because there's one other aspect of scaling that will kind of come in at the end of the show. But while my little blocks are on my table, we're going to go back to the blocks. All right. Let's think about the surface of this. So this block of one has six sides, right? So it has its surface area. If we consider each one of these planes as one, its surface area is six. Okay. Now, what about this one? When I double the size of it. So if there are six sides and you're seeing four of them on each side, right? We now know we've got 24 surfaces in there because there's six sides multiplied by four. Six sides over here on this one multiplied by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Six times nine is the number of surfaces that are on the outside of this one here. So is the surface area growing at the same rate that the volume is well let's just let's 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 try this let's do a surface to volume ratio right so here six to one what about over here well this is going to be 24 to 8 which is the same thing as uh, 12 to 4, which is the same thing as uh, 6 to 2, which is the same thing as 3 to 1. Whew. We started here with six surfaces for every one volume. Over here, we're now down to three surfaces for every one. So this, there's less surface here for the volume than there was here. Let's try that one more time. If we went, uh, what would this be? So we're, we're talking 54. So there's our surface to volume ratio. And <clears throat> this is kind of cool. Uh, look at this. If we take 27 and we add it to 27, um, okay, that's 14 and that's five. Oh, it's 54. That means that this is two to one. So we went from six to one to three to one, to two to one, as we are getting bigger, the amount of available surface here relative to the, the volume inside, it's going down. This at the, uh, we're gonna come uh, uh, back to this in a moment. This whole idea that the mass, this, the, the, the volume of this thing is just going boom, is exploding while the amount of surface area relative to that area, uh, that, 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 that volume inside, is plummeting. What does this have to do with drawing an elephant? Well, I'm glad you asked. All right. So that's, that's the background scaling. And I think it is really fun to just see that with a few cubes.
because it then helps us think about these big critters in fundamentally different ways. They are going to act differently because they're because they're big. So the, the flea is supposed to, like you've, you've probably seen these things. If you, you know, blew, or, you know, grew a flea up to the size of a human, it could jump over the Empire State Building. Newsflash, it can't. It could not get off the ground, right? Because it'd be like, I'm a big flea. <laughs> I'm going to try to move my legs. Oh, I just collapsed all my limbs. I didn't move at all. It would be a bad day for the giant flea. Right? So now let's take a look at what are you going to do about this? So, so here, here's, here's, here's the, the biomechanics of this are going to start to come in. Right? If you've ever taken a karate class, they make you get in horse stance, right? And sit there and do this till you're blue in the face and your calves start screaming. You, you, you're sitting there in a horse stance doing this. You're, you're in this squat perpetually, and it's really, really, really hard. And something that's funny to do is you look in these classes, because there's also the kids' class. The kids' class, they're all down in horse stance. It's going, ah, wah, 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 wah. And then all the adults are going, ah, ah, ah. This is killing me. The reason that those little kids are having an easier time is scaling. It's harder for them to do because I mean, it's harder for the grown-ups to do because they're bigger, right? So the um, so so what we do as the adult starts to feel those calves burning what the adults in doing in they'll, they'll be like <laughs> right and then they they start doing this <sighs> they're straightening they're cheating they're no longer in that horse stance they're straightening their legs out because if you do this all the way your legs are locked out all your weight is borne by your skeleton it's easy to stand this way. It hurts to stand this way. This is a little bit easier. This is a little bit easier. This locked out is, is the easiest way of all. So if it's easier to stand with your legs locked out and not in horse stance, and you're going to be the size of an elephant, you're never going to see an elephant in horse stance. So um, let me bounce over to, hold on a second. This is an iguana. And the iguana is not a very big critter. So if you look at the iguana, um, its front legs are locked out, or not locked out, um, are out in this bent position. And if you watch an iguana, crawl around um the uh the iguana as it does um hold on, i'm gonna select camera the oops no you don't want to come over there one second there we go yeah this this iguana as it's crawling around is doing this right so the iguana stops the iguana is doing a little iguana push-up so when we first started to dig down into the dirt and find big bones and pull up dinosaur skeletons people started to put these together and they said like there's something kind of reptile-y going on here let's reconstruct these. So you naturally want to put these things together. They would reconstruct them based on a model that they had. And so they looked over at the iguana and they said, all right, you're standing like this. Let's do the same with our dinosaurs. So the early dinosaur drawings, you see the dinosaurs are doing this kind of push-up. 
Can you see what's wrong with this picture? Stegosaurus is in horse stance, right? That's not going to work well for a great big dinosaur. Dinosaur like this can't be in horse stance. And so, you know, you look at this front leg out here, it's like, ah, like feel the burn, feel the burn, right? That would have to be like incredible, uh, 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 right? And so, um, interestingly enough, if you look at, at um, modern dinosaur pictures, there's now like, like here, these dinosaurs are dancing, right? Modern dinosaur pictures, dinosaurs can dance, right? And when they hang out by themselves, look at those straight limbs, all right? The limbs are locking out underneath the dinosaur. Let's just take another look at a dinosaur doing horse dance again. Oh, this is kind of fun. This is one of my, <laughs> this is great, uh, dinosaur, uh, Ray Bonto, this is for you, dinosaurs coming your way. Um, Ray Bonto, if you're watching, can you, oh, 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 don't look, don't look at the label, don't look at the label, but by looking at this one, the one that's gnawing on the other one's back, <laughs> with dinosaurs, they, they just didn't have very much to do. They sat around and they chewed on each other. And, but that one with the big horn on its forehead, who's that? Well, uh, let's take another look at it. Like here it is, there's, there's, there's this big, look at these guys there. They're kind of sprawling like a big old uh, lizard, all right? Um, and they've got these horns on the, <laughs> on the, on the, on the, sometimes they put it on the forehead, sometimes they put it on the tip of the nose. So these ones with the tip of the nose. So I have to look, this one's gonna go chase down these people over here. <laughs> Those little Victorian people in the background. Ah, right. Um, so what's up with these ones? This was, these were reconstructions of Iguanodon. That spike now gets moved to the thumb. It was not on the head like a little unicorn. And also, instead of doing this squat thing, it's spending most of its time on its back legs and can briefly kind of lightly touch down for a little bit of balance with its front limbs. But the back legs are then locked out and that's gonna hold you up. So there's our little iguanodon, move your spike to your thumb. So just as um, we are doing this with, um, with these critters, yes, let's talk elephants. Because the same thing is going to happen with elephants. Look at these straight limbs. You've got this big limb coming right down here. This, this other one stepping out straight. These back limbs coming down straight. Now, um, you're familiar with, um, say, deer and antelope and wildebeest and these sorts of critters. In um, those, as this, lots of the weight is being held by the front legs. So the front legs actually bear a lot of the weight. The back legs in those sort of animals can be bent for some extra power and push. But if you're really heavy, you need your back legs to be straight too. And so what we're going to see is um, these, these, these animals, animals piling up their limbs, and it's what's called a graviportal, grava for gravity, portal holding up, holding up gravity, a graviportal posture. And so you're going to stack the weight like that. And that is what's going to help you be able to, to move around. Now let's take a look at that worksheet. So, um, uh, Avail, would you put into the chat, please, the, the link for the worksheet again? If you're just joining us now, here comes this, this, this link. Um, and uh, you can print out this worksheet. If you've already got that, um, then you are good to go. But we are going to move our scaling math to the side. And um, you should have a sheet like this one. And let me see if I can zoom down. Make our front a little bit bigger. No, nope. no, there, that's the way. All right, they do let me know if I go um, off 
off this the, the, the screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some meat on these bones. And um, I have, um, let's first just work with this front leg. The front leg is holding a lot of this weight. Look at like, if you were to, like if this, if you kind of trimmed this off here, you could balance all this stuff here just on that front leg. The back leg is not holding as much weight. So the front leg is big like a tree. Oh, let me, I'm kind of changing the focus level of this. So, uh, manual focus, let's stop it from changing its focus. There we go. All right, now my hand comes in. Good, we're staying focused on the piece of paper. So. Um, this is your shoulder blade up here. And from your back of your shoulder blade, along this surface here, there are great, there's great big, big muscles, um, tricep muscles, and they are coming down this way, coming down here. And they're going to attach onto this little bump right back here. So this this is my triceps muscle um, coming down here. I also have um, other muscles that are working in the front of the leg. And um, they attach up in here and are going to give the, the front part of the leg a little bit of thickness, but not nearly as much. So I've got a big block here on the front part of my leg. Now, below that, I have muscles that are going to come down here. We're going to be, it's going to be thinner. So these muscles come down and insert in here, attaching up in here. We'll have more muscles coming down and inserting in here. And that gives you this sort of thinner lower leg. Thinner being a relative term. Notice that it is up on its toes in this picture. So it's up on its toes. It has a big cushy pad right back here of shock absorber material. And then its little elephant foot is going to attach onto that. So it kind of goes to a big, um, uh, to, a, to, a, to a broad little pad that swells out in the front and the back. So it's up on its toes. This means if this elephant were to bend its leg, it would be doing that. Now, on the back leg, we have a similar situation. From this point of the hip out here down to the knee, there is a big mass of meat that comes down from the back edge of the Actually, I meant to use this one, sorry, from the back edge of my thigh, from the front edge of my thigh, I am, oh, I'm off the screen, nope, ah, come back, there we go. I have my big leg here, put this leg back in here. The muscles that are down here are much thinner and strap like. And then the same thing, I've got that little cushy heel, like the little Dr. Scholl's pad for the elephant. And then my foot's going to flare out from there. So the legs think bigger on top. 
and then a thick column coming straight down under that. <clears throat> what about the rest of the contours of the elephant? Well, to hold this head up, there is a big ligament that is going to go from along the back here and it is going to attach in to these processes that helps hold this head up these spines on the back are sticking up here to help hold up this whole head so and then your back of your head the skin is going to go from this high point to the top of your head so that gives you one high point here oh jack uh, could you lower just a teeny tad ah perfect so you've then got a big scoop here there's another prominence here for supporting more ligaments on the back here, which gives you a second bump high on the back here. And from there, you're curving down the rump of the elephant. So you've got this double bump. You can think of these towers like the tower on a crane that has going to have a big weight out here there's a line that goes to that so that this weight doesn't snap the crane so like a suspension bridge um, that's what's going on with these towers here and here now on the head we're going to come off the head and this little bump here, there's a hole in here where the nostrils come out. This little spot in here is actually where your eye is. And where the nostrils come out, we're going to have our trunk that protrudes out there. Big old blubbery elephant lip. And then there are there's a strong muscle that um, the brachiocephalus that comes from the head down to here and that gives you this front contour of your elephant what about the elephant tummy well you have it's got um, muscles and guts down in here but its skin is often then loose around that and coming out from somewhere close to above the elbow here to at a downward sloping angle to close to the knee here. That's going to give you this little kind of down, downward slope on your elephant. And the last thing is the ear so the ear is attaching back here on the back of the head is going to be um, a giant triangle that covers up this little gap in the neck down here but sometimes when it lifts its ear up and you'll get different ear shapes on different individual elephants it's a really fun thing to look like look at not only do they have little tears and rink and rips in them at different places if bulls are getting in fights but there will be some just uh, individual variation in ear shape just like human beings um, that is sort of the general mass of the elephant very useful things to keep in mind here are this negative shape underneath the legs so the negative shape negative shape is um is a, a a term we use to describe when you're not looking at the elephant you're looking at the air next to the elephant right so if i have um uh, an, an elephant and I wanted to, to draw it, a great strategy is to start with the negative shapes. So I might start with just what is, what is the line along this elephant's back? And 
elephant is walking by, I would try to get that line. And then I want to say to myself, oh, all right, my elephant, if its back is that long, its body is going to be roughly this deep. I want to get this body to be long enough. If it is too uh, skinny, you're going to feel like your elephant is on slim fast and it's just not going to look elephant. -y. And then I want to put in my legs. How do you do that? Look at the negative shape again. What is the shape of the air coming down here? I'm going to come up, little elephanty armpit. So I would put in this negative shape. And from there, I am now thinking positive shape. I'm thinking like, oh, I've got my leg that is coming here. And what are my elephant legs going to be doing? I'm going to have my ear in this area and my lovely trunk. But this negative shape, the body width, and then this negative shape, that's going to be really useful at blocking in my friend the elephant. Let's look at a different elephant friend. All right. What I'd like everybody to do is first visualize what the bones are doing inside this elephant. Visualize those bones inside the elephant. Now, let's draw that elephant. <clears throat> I'm going to make this one smaller. All right, so it's got a little head that comes down, and I'm going to go up to one bump, little elephant backside. All right, I'm going to have an elephant body somewhere in there like that. And my elephant leg is going to come down here. Here's this cool little shape. Look at this on this back leg here. I'm going to put in this negative shape. Little negative shape there. Look at that back leg. What about placing this whole kind of chest and trunk? Look at this negative shape here, this little negative shape here. Oh, that helped me kind of get, let's see if I just drew this head, if I get a head that'd be too big and too far out there. So what does that mean? That means that above here, I want, I want my head kind of moving over here. I'm gonna move my, my elephant head down here. And then I'm going to give it this nice big ear. Hey, do you remember that surface to volume ratio thing that I mentioned before? This is where that comes in. That comes in with the ears. If I um, want to lose heat and out there on the savanna I do, um, then what I do is I lose heat through my skin. The more elephant skin I have, the more I can lose heat. So it's not this one, the critter doesn't have a problem getting warm, it has a problem with losing that heat. So by having a giant ear that um, increases the amount of skin surface that I have, 
that's my cooling mechanism. So I'm overcoming part of my problem with not having enough um, not having enough surface area to get rid of my heat by having these enormous ears. And then I just um, take my trunk and spray some water up onto my ears and I can get evaporative cooling going with my little elephant ears. And um, that is going to make me, uh, that will make me happy. I want to encourage people to go online, find pictures of elephants, and draw them. But first, really pay attention to that graviportal posture. Get your negative shape on the top and the one on the bottom. Now, let's talk rhinoceros. So rhinoceros is not as big. Or actually, that, so here's the one on the bottom. That's my rhinoceros. Check this out. The rhinoceros... Um, that horn is not bone. That horn is, is material like your fingernails. And it grows um, just like your fingernails grow and gets longer as the rhinoceros gets, 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 gets bigger. Um, these critters have a... Um, one of the, the, the real... Uh, downsides of this is that human beings have decided that these horns are valuable either as medicine now um, so if you were there's there's something called the doctrine of signatures which means if something looks like something it must be medically useful for something this is an idea that has been with us since the middle ages and never worked just because a violet leaf has a shape of a heart or a walnut is shaped like um, is a walnut is shaped like a brain does not mean that it helps your brain. It doesn't work that way. Um, but it was an interesting idea. Um, but to this day, people are taking um, there is a huge black market trade for not just elephant ivory, so in the last century, we have lost 90% of our elephants. Um, and a big portion of that is due to poaching. Um, since I was born, the population of black rhinos has dropped by 97% because of poaching for these horns and it is made out of the same material as your fingernail so if you want the medicinal benefits of rhinoceros horn chew your fingernails it's the same stuff it's the same stuff um so the <clears throat> But let's 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 think about this this uh, how we're gonna uh, handle our rhino here. So notice on our rhino, um, let's just work on its contours. We have the arch of the back. We have this bump up on the top, and that's going to connect to the uh, back here. So we're gonna from the head to the back here. There is. Um, it's it's essentially straight. You'll find on white rhinoceros, when they lift their head, they will get an extra big bulge that sticks up here. But on black rhinoceros, that's not the case. There is the bump from this point in the suspension bridge, the bump from this point in the suspension bridge, and then there's a bonus bump back here from the point of the hip. So on the rhinoceros, you also get this extra this bump this bump and then you get this other bump in the back and we kind of curve our tail around from there the rhinoceros oh jack um could you scooch oh. over a little bit thank you um so our 
our head is going to curve down here. One horn attaches here. And the other horn attaches a little bit further back here. And different individual rhinoceroses, rhinoceri, rhinoceroses, rhinocerisms will have um, different shaped and different size horns. Its eye is right here. Its ear is back here at the at this juncture here. Ears on black rhinoceroses are a little bit more smaller and rounder. They're longer and more pointed on white rhinoceros. Um, this being a black rhinoceros, it's got a little bit more of a pointed mouth and a lip. A white rhinoceros has a very flat face. So if this were a, a white rhinoceros, we would kind of come down here in a flat face. And then our um, rhinoceros nostril is going to be up in this area. So the eye, the nostril, the eye, and the ear are kind of on the same line here. We're having the same thing going on, big in front, big muscles in front. So this upper area is big muscle, just as it was on our elephant. And then the lower foreleg is going to be a little cone coming down from that. And very often, right at this junction, there is there are really cool skin folds and the skin will often kind of curve around like this with the foreleg tucking up into that skin fold. So look for this big kind of creased fold right up here. So from there we go down to the rhinoceros's wrist. And then you have the rhinoceros toes on the ground. On the back legs, the same thing is going on. You have from the hip bone up here to this point of the hip out here to the knee, you have this big mass of muscle up in here. And then the skin will often kind of droop down around that. So you have the same thing of the leg kind of coming out as a cone, a cone sticking down from that to the heel. Here's your instep of your foot with your toes on the ground. So you can get a little fold in here. You can get this big fold in here. You'll sometimes get kind of folds in the skin here and here, and sometimes in the neck as well. And then to finish this out, your belly really comes, comes down, but then it really tucks back up in here on the rhinoceros. The rhinoceros are faster than elephants. They can outrun you easily. Well, so can an elephant. Um, but um, so the, 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 the back here is built for a little bit more speed. Then we have a big thick neck that is going to go from the back of the head like this. So your rhinoceros profile, um, you're going to have this bump, this bump, and your bonus bump back here big flat zone to the head then with this long skull right you have this big long skull you're going to have your ears that stick out the top a big scoop forehead place and then your horns coming down off the tip of that This 
big crease in the skin is a very useful thing to look for. So if I were making a sketch of this critter, I would again start with that negative shape on the back. I then want to get my body to be the right depth. So I want to think I want my body to be the right depth in here. I'm going to have a big limb that, in, in, that comes down here and a big limb in here. And that negative sh shape between them is going to be very, very helpful. For drawing a head, I recommend looking at negative shapes before positive shapes. So what I would probably do is look at what is the shape of the air between the leg and that face that is coming down. And that helps me put in my, my, my head. I'm now going to have my horn coming out here, another horn coming out here, big long forehead long pointy ears. So is that a white rhinoceros or a black rhinoceros? Hmm. But on these legs here, this fold of skin where the um, foreleg comes in. I think that that's a, that's a very helpful thing to look for. And finally, the hippopotamus. Nice little black rhinoceros here, a little more pointed nose. Not as big a space here. Beautiful black rhinoceros. Mm, mm. But there's a hippo. There's a hippo. Big old snossage. On this, Let's look at the negative space underneath its body for just a moment. Can we please do that? Just look at how little clearance there is on a hippopotamus. If you want your hippo to look hippo-y, give it, <laughs> get that belly low slung to the ground. There's not going to be a lot of legs. But, um, so, on my hippo friend here, I can think of it this way. I have, um, there are muscles that detach the back of the head here with the, 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 the spine. Right? Those are your trapezius muscles. So they form a big wedge up in here. Um, also, kind of sculpting my, 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 my hippopotamus. There are, there are muscles and things in here, but I'm not gonna really see most of that. On my back, it's much more rounded. And then below where this rib cage comes in, my belly is really sagging down there. So I've got my, this big 
snossage of the body. My front leg is doing a uh, it's 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 best work with its graviportal posture. And it is just going to tuck right into these tissues of the belly. And as I come around on the back leg, it's going to be the same thing. I'm going to have big layers of hippopotamus folded down there. And my back leg will appear as a little stub underneath that. The neck or the, the head of the hippopotamus, the ear is right up here by the eye. The eye is making a big lump so that it can be out of the water. You're going to have a lump of tissue on the tip of the nose as well. And then the lips go all the way around these big teeth. And finally, there's a huge jaw muscle back here in the back of the head. You have layers of flexible neck tissue down here. So your hippopotamus um, is going to hide a lot of this anatomy. Makes it a little bit easier to draw. Oh, and then they've got this really cute tail. They've got this, just this little stub of a tail. Um, <clears throat> when they, when they, uh, when they uh, go to the bathroom, they take their tail and they spin it around really fast. And so, they, or they, they, they wave it back and forth. And so it just sprays hippopotamus fecal material all over the place. So you'll see them if they kind of get out of the water, watch for this and they're gonna kind of, um, My first visit to Tanzania, um, you, we were, one of the, the reasons we didn't uh, sleep close to, we were in tents that were kind of this mobile uh, campsite. And we didn't want to sleep near the river because if the hippopotamus came out, first of all, hippopotamus, extremely dangerous critter. Um, and if they didn't trample you, they would spray uh, a, a, a fine mist of hippopotamus fecal material all over the tents because they were good things to mark. And so they had learned not to do that there. Um, there's just a little bit of, of, of hippopotamus time. Um, try just making a hippo sketch, kind of block this in. Think about that sort of posture. Think what negative shapes you would use to block in this hippopotamus. And I'll finally kind of tell you one, uh, while you're doing that, I'll give you one last thought on, on, on hippo sketching. Oh, by the way, a yeah, hippo's mouth comes all the way back here, kind of drops down. Um, so when you're seeing hippos, most often, they are hanging out in the water. So all you really see of the hippo is this much. <laughs> so if you kind of have your little hippo that's, that's the most you're going to see of, of, of a lot of the hippos. So make a sketch, 
try to understand what is happening anatomically underneath here. And that is your hippo fun. So I hope that um, this kind of gave you an idea of what is happening underneath the hood with these. Now it's kind of interesting. You would think that because these are all, you know, big boned critters that, um, the uh, uh, I like Avea's comment here. <laughs> no matter how cute, we do not boop the snoot of the hippos. That would be that would be bad. Um, actually, uh, one of the I've had two kind of scary experiences in uh, kind of bopping around in Africa. And one of them was with a, a hippo. Hippos end up hippos and Cape buffalo, uh, or not Cape of buffalo, but uh, the African buffalo are are you don't want to tangle with those. Um, when I was uh, in Rwanda, our last visit, <clears throat> I was walking along the side of a river and um, I saw this, uh, there were people on the other side of the river and they were waving and they were yelling at me. <laughs> and I thought, how nice, they're my friends. And I waved back and they waved more. And I waved and I kept walking along my little spotting scope and they were jumping up and down and waved. <laughs> they were just so friendly. And I jumped up and down and I waved back at them. Just going, like, people are just, just so nice. And I came around the next corner, hippopotamus was on my side of the river and fortunately was looking there, but I came right around this area of reeds and there's a boom, there's a big old hippopotamus right there. And I was exactly where you don't want to be. And I'm like, this is why we're waving. And I almost became a statistic. So uh, don't mess with your hippopotamus. Um, and, um, but still wave to people because most often people are friendly. Um, but I hope there are some useful strategies in here that um, you can use um, to help you be able to draw some of these critters. Having an understanding of that anatomy terms of from like these weird lumpy things like what's up with all that those bumps on your back. Having that architecture is really fun. And I think that having an understanding of the math that is behind the elephant is also really cool. Like, what's up with those ears? Oh, it's bonus surface area. I think that's just so, so elegant. It's really neat. Um, so it's fun to look at animals just for their own intrinsic beauty, but the more we kind of physiologically start to understand them, there's incredible things going on. And uh, it just makes me appreciate them all the more. So thank you all for being here. Now what I'd love to do is see if there are any elephanty, hippo-y, um, uh, rhinoceros-y comments or questions. Um, so if you've got a comment on that or a question on that, um, then please, uh, hey, let's join Kate Chandler. Kate, it's great to see you. I'm gonna bring you in, add you into the spotlight and you can now unmute. Hi, so I was just kind of wondering about their digestive system because a lot of times with really heavy um, megafauna, especially in North America, they tend to be ruminants and that's a lot of the reason they're packing so much weight is to carry around those massive digestive systems. So do we know if um, rhinos, hippos, and elephants are ruminants or if they're hindgut uh, fermenters like horses? I don't know. Um, let's throw that one out to the, 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 the audience here. That's... Um... That's a really, really interesting question. If anybody knows a little bit about their digestive processes, um, the uh, I know that um, no, I, 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 I don't. But that's a really fun question. So you, you see, what I want to kind of point out to, to folks was kind of really cool. What's going on with um, Kate knows a lot about horses and. 
Um, and so she's looking at that. You kind of start kind of down the path of I wonder, and it reminds me of what you know about one group is going to inform other really interesting questions about other um, organisms and being really intentional about wondering about things, the physiology of these, these, these critters just makes being a naturalist much more, more interesting. So yeah, um, I really like that. Question. And it's interesting kind of thinking about like the function of that too, because I would imagine with these animals, they're not flight animals so much as fight animals. Um, because like the whole reason that a horse has a hind gun uh, fermentation system is so that, you know, when they're threatened, horses, um, horses actually have a bit of everything going for their defense mechanism. So if a horse is scared, the first thing they do before they run or before they kick is they're going to poop, which means they're dropping probably 10, maybe 15 pounds of um, weight off of their system. And then they get ready to do whatever is going to happen next. And they wow. can even poop while they're running. So they're jumping as much weight as possible. And that fast digestive system allows them to do that. You know, when, when you're, I know you train lots of horses and work with horses who haven't been treated right, is whether they're pooping or not one of the warning signs that you um, look out for to uh, see if a, a horse is getting agitated? Yeah, it's actually a really good precursor to if a horse is really nervous, like you're going to a situation where there's something that they're aware of that they're worried about. A lot of times they'll stop, they'll look at stuff and then they'll poop and they'll walk along a little bit. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's more like they are preparing. And that gives me like a really good like precursor warning of I'm not comfortable with the situation. And so I'm preparing for uh, my defense mechanisms. Yeah. It's not necessarily a bad thing though. Cause like plenty of perfectly relaxed horses being in a stressful situation if they see something they don't like, they'll go, oh, this is the first response. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's not necessarily a good or bad thing. It just lets you know that that's like, they're preparing. Yeah, something may be up. That's cool. Um, yeah. Love the question. Uh, Louise wrote into the chat that uh, those three are non-ruminant uh, herbivores, according to some of the references that she has. Um, so thank you, Louise. Huh. For Oh, that's really interesting. I would not have guessed that. It'd be fun to look up uh, just what is going on with their digestive system. Yeah. The, um, and, and also be interesting to look at what they do. Oh, you should pull Ivea on. It looks like she has the answer for us. Ah, let's, here we go. As always. Ah. <laughs> it's not an answer for all of them but it's in, um, it, it's my visual dictionary. Um, and I'm not sure if the stuff has changed, but elephant, hmm. if that helps. Wow, that is the green, it's digestive tract? I believe yeah. so, yes. Wow. So maybe it just has a really efficient hind gut fermentation system or something like that. Yeah, and also be interested yeah. in looking at what strategies they have for water retention. Mm -hmm. I know the, the, the hippopotamus doesn't worry about it. The hippopotamus just like it's all well, I'm gonna be back in the water this evening uh, by the morning so they come out of the water and kind of graze um, at night um, which you know talk about kind of great strategy for beating the heat they just walk around at night and the rest of the time they stay in the water <laughs> yeah um, well I guess for hippopotamus too that they need to be have access to just a ton of vegetation and with water stuff that's growing near water to be really rich stuff so I imagine they wouldn't need to be worried about you know, uh, getting the most out of everything, like things like cows and all the ruminids, their whole system is basically, I'm gonna have the most intense digestive system ever. So I can like scrape as much nutrients out of really meager stuff as possible. Um, the most surprised that elephants don't do that because they exist in a lot of different environments, some of which are kind of hostile. Hmm. So. I was going to ask, actually, um, if, if you know how earlier on you were talking about um, ratio of surface area to volume, I was going to ask if because because it sounds like the larger um, the volume, then the more the ratio decreases. Um, does that mean that being big actually helps them to retain more water? 
because if they had oh. more surface area, then they would lose more water to evaporation. And that would, yeah, you, you, you would not be, you don't have as much surface to sweat from. Exactly. Um, Wait, but do they sweat? Because a lot of animals do not. Okay. Like, exactly. Yeah. And, and so, so yeah, that we think of kind of how do I keep my heat um, as being the problem. But for the big critters, it's how do I shed my heat? And the yeah. bigger you get, the bigger a problem that is. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, you, so when we think about animals being warm blooded, cold blooded, sort of scientists usually don't use those terms because they're, they're not specific enough to be really useful. There's two different things is, is your average body temperature warm or is your average body temperature colder than ours? And does your body temperature change over time? Um, or does your body temperature stay the same? So if you are endothermic, you make your own heat. If you're ectothermic, you get it from the outside. If you are, um, uh, you know, like for instance, a Chuck Walla has an, uh, an average body temperature that would kill most human beings or all of us, right? Um, if you had an average body temperature like that, it would fry you from the inside and you would not be part of the conversation. Um, but its temperature also is going up and down with the day. So when we think about something like dinosaurs, and people say, like, we're dinosaurs warm blooded. Well, once you get that big, any heat you've got on board, you've got on board, right? So the, um, and uh, then there is uh, some other bone evidence that we're, you're creating your, your own body heat. But, you know, once you, you know that all those big things, like, like a, a, a big uh, animal that dies can take, you know, days to kind of get down to kind of, uh, ambient temperature. Yeah. And that's yeah, what then you get exploding yeah. whales. Oh yeah. Do we know if those digestive systems um, are generating heat? Just the process of like breakdown from bacteria and stuff? Because I wonder if for like the large dinosaurs, if that would if they're using like a fermentation system in there, um, if that could be like an internal heat generation for some of those really big animals. Sort of like the way that at the beginning of a compost, when you're doing a compost system, that yeah. it gets hot enough that it steams. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if that's even possible. I'm just thinking of like, you uh, know, it's an interesting basically thought. compost. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you for the questions and thank you, Avea, for the 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 diagram. It'd be interesting yeah, to, the diagram. to sort of study more about their digestive pro the efficiency of their digestive process and there's a horse for oh thank you <laughs> <laughs> excellent um i am now going to bounce over to uh let's go to ann chatter from point blue conservation science um and great to see you i'm going to add you into the spotlight here and uh, there's your hippopotamus friend um Hold on, you can now unmute. Oh, try that again. Um, now I'll try to unmute. Yeah, there we go. Okay. There we go. All right. So I noticed, and I wonder, um, in that last picture of the hippo that you had, it seemed like there was a little, some little bumps on its neck, right about in there. And I just wonder, does it have some weird muscle thing going on up there, or was I hallucinating that? Um, we may have up there on the between the neck and the back. There's a zone where it's uh, there are some fat rolls. Okay. Um, let's let me uh, go back to this one, and we'll take another look here. Yeah, those. Ah, those bumps there. Yeah. Um, what is causing those? I don't know, but I will look into that and see if I can find out. Okay, cool. Yeah, but between there and that that back is that is the zone where um, 
So its, it's neck is coming in lower than that, and from these big spines on the back here to the back of the head, and there's a big uh, nuchal ligament that is going uh, in, in here. And so that will, uh, but I don't know what makes those that, that paired bump. That's cool. Yeah. Good observation. Okay. Um, and then I got Robert Bateman's <laughs> Safari book out of the library. So if anybody wants books on this stuff, um, it's just marvelous. I mean, just even the inside flap is just and so nice. cool. Love that them. is really fun. Yeah. So I've been playing with those. Um, Robert Bateman has also done so much to bring attention to conservation issues with his artwork. Funds a lot of different projects. Um, the Bateman Foundation does really also neat things with um, uh, conservation and art education. Yeah, and did you know that Bea Martin, who's coming with us to Tanzania, has been working with the Bateman Foundation? She's yes, been teaching for them. that's right. So great. And then I have a non-related, but it's environmental. And I was just um, online looking at the um, OceanWise Foundation that's based in Vancouver, but it works worldwide. And they just did some great research on microplastics, microfibers that end up, you know, when you do your wash, um, yes. and they end up going into drains and a lot goes into the ocean and causes big problems with plastics in the ocean. And they just found that if you just use the gentle cycle, it reduces the release of microfibers by, what percentage do you think? I Take am going guess. to, I'm guessing that it is, sort of imagine those things being agitated and bounced up against all these sorts of things, things rubbing off. Anybody in the chat? I'm going to say that you are going to release 40% more. Uh, you're going to reduce it by 40%. Higher. Oh, goody. All right. Gentle cycle. Here I come. 70%. Um, 70%. 70%. So everybody, <laughs> use the gentle cycle and tell all your friends. Use the gentle cycle. So this does two things, fewer microplastics, and your jacket lasts longer. Yeah, and you're being gentle. <laughs> That's right. It's a good thing. So, so yes, may we all use our gentle cycle. Yes. All right. Thank you. Great hey, class. Thank you. Thank you for the, um, the, 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 the conservation news as well. Yeah. That was Ann Chadwick from Point Blue Conservation Science, also another wonderful organization that does uh, conservation work around the globe with birds and other species um, to give us science-based solutions for ecological problems. Thank you again for the work you're doing. Um, now I'm gonna pop over to my gallery view. Um, did anybody else uh, have something to to, to share any, uh, let's open this up to anybody with uh, journal pages that you wanted to share, thoughts, comments, philosophy, uh, what's on your mind. Let's join Kate again. Hello, Kate. Oh, hold on, now you can unmute. Oh, I just want to show some journal pages because I was really glad to get back in with this community and start working on stuff again. Um, so I thought I'd show you what I've been working on, getting my pencil miles in. Wonderful, um, so here's some pages from our last class, and then just some practice. Um, nice. Getting those quadrupeds in, playing with wash a little bit. Gouache and I are not friends. Yet. We're working yet. on it. Not yet. Uh, watercolor, I'll show you the finished product of that one later. Um, just doing some pencil miles and trying to figure out like if I should do a thing of like going through with a bunch of species that I'm not really familiar with and start just working on basics. Um, what I'm doing lately is I just got my big brush pen out because um, I bought that because it looked fun that I stuck it somewhere and never used it. So I just got my big ink brush pen and started working on just doing like very quick figure sketches of ducks oh, and stuff and trying to get more comfortable 
with like just quickly drawing and doing the forms and stuff. No fear. I feel like I invest a lot of time into drawings that I don't feel quite comfortable with, like how natural it feels with the yeah. movement and the shape. And so I really want to just get in a lot of pencil miles with just, you know, quick and dirty practice mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. um, in all kinds of species and uh, positions and all that. Such a good idea. Such a good idea. And especially because I feel like it gets so intimidating to practice too. And I did this to myself where I was like, oh yeah, I need to have time to sit down at my desk with my paints. I'm like, no, you don't. You need one pen and some reference pictures or a reference somewhere. Yeah. And yeah. that's kind of it. And so I'm trying to just like really find ways to put the time in and to practice as much as I physically can again, because that's the main thing that really improved. That's, so, it makes such a, such a difference. Oh, this yeah. is really exciting. Really yeah. exciting. Ha -ha! I mean, it's kind of, yeah, so that's what we did for today. Oh, it's kind of cool. I think, can I show you guys something? My stack of sketchbooks from the year, which you guys probably will see. I won't go yes. through them, but I'm just going to stack them up for you. To show All you right, the so pencil folks, miles. This is when we talk about pencil miles. Check out what Kate has been doing. There. So she, wow. <laughs> and this is missing one that uh, I had given to my partner before we broke up in mm -hmm. January. But um, let's see. February, I'll just do a quick little open it up and show you a page or something from. So that's what I was doing in February. Yeah. Apologies. Um, that going on to March. Uh, April. There was a point where I stopped doing one a month, but yeah. April. Got the frigate birds. Oh, uh, yes. May, this one went on my uh, to Charleston with me, or I guess trip across the country to Charleston. Yep. Let's see. June one, and I think June has some. Uh, Yeah. June. Oh, this is really fun. July. <laughs> but yeah, it's just kind of cool to like look back and see just like how much. Wow. In there. So that's that's just dedication and no fear. Like sometimes our journals get precious. And we only are going to do something in it if we can kind of meet some standard. You're really getting yourself to do. I'm going to do more and 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 do more. And those pencil miles make such a difference. Yeah, and I'm seeing the chat people asking about what kind of journal, and basically, it doesn't really matter. I would say experiment with different things, and don't get a journal that's going to intimidate you because. Like early in the year, I bought this one, which is like the Strathmore or something. And it was a little bit pricey. And so I didn't use it and didn't use it and didn't use it because I was afraid that my art wasn't really worthy of it, which is ridiculous because at the end of the day, it's just a sketchbook. Um, and I ended up using it and having a great time with it. But the thing I like to do most is buy sketchbooks like this one, which is the, um, the Talons Art Creation I think it's the A4 um, because they cost $15 and they have amazing quality paper that takes the watercolor really well. Um, but it doesn't intimidate me with going, oh, I don't want to ruin this very nice sketchbook. Yes. So get something that has a lot of versatility and can take a lot of abuse, um, but it's cheap enough where you don't feel bad just filling it up. That's really, really good advice really good advice that those pencil miles it, it, it changes the structure of your brain mm -hmm. and i'm trying to just get back into that habit of practicing because 
I feel like life kind of got in the way and I realized that I need to figure out how to make it so that I can get a couple hours of this in every day to keep getting to where I want to go with it. Now, to tell us about your sort of your, uh, how do you work this into sort of daily routines to make this habit? To make <laughs> I this wish practice? I had a daily routine. The main thing I do is I just drag me this with me places, um, hence the need for it to be durable. And I figure if I bring it with me enough places, eventually, like you're sitting in a waiting room somewhere, you are on break at work. There's all kinds of opportunities where instead of picking up your phone, you can reach for this. And I need to get better at doing it. But the fact that I have it with me constantly really does help. Yeah. Yeah. Just, so, yeah. Let's all think for a moment about how accessible is our stuff. And do I, am I saying to myself like, oh, that's not, that's not a good enough subject. And, you know, I'm just here in the waiting room and there's this potted plant here. Mm -hmm. No, I need to go find a rare species of bird. <laughs> um, so that's I really inspiring. Reception at a veterinary office is when things get really slow. I like to draw patients. So that's good. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that pile. Yeah. That's really Anger inspiring to see. Next time I make it, I'll go through some of them. But are you going to finish your most recent journal by the end of December? That's my goal. I am not going to put too much pressure on myself to do it. I think at the rate I'm going, I'm about a third of the way through or about a third of the way through December, I think, a little less. So we're on track for it. So fingers crossed. Um, that's great. So Avea says I always, uh, I'm always within five feet of paper and writing supplies. Uh, if I line notebook instead of my nature journal, I draw in it instead. Having it close by means we draw more. Yeah. And line paper is not safe from our doodling. I've been that, abusing right. line paper since kindergarten, I think. So, yeah. <laughs> Get your doodle on. Yeah, I um, am uh, in negotiation with um, one of my daughter's teachers to allow her to sketch note and um is that and, not something that the teacher is enthusiastic about and not at this point oh not at this point um oh. but um i have a pile of materials to come in and put on the desk as well as some journal articles mm -hmm. and i'm going to come in and just sort of try to be like you know here's friendly evidence-based jack coming in and yeah we'll we'll, we'll see <laughs> If, if, if that if that helps I think sometimes people but I think this that uh, this is somebody who would like to have everything coming in digitally in the same well, platform that's... in a way that makes it easier to grade and I understand that teachers are busy I know I do find that really hard too because like for all my academic notes for some reason I do not do well with like technology for that sort of thing. I need to have like hard copies and all that. Um, and part of it is the act of writing by hand and just drawing too. Like you have this visual that accompanies the information. I feel like for a lot of classes I did in college, um, sketch noting really added to it because like anything science-based, I vigorously sketch noted it. Um, instead of just writing things down so I'd have like the whole visual to understand how things work at a glance instead of having to like go back and like look for a visual when I was going back through my notes. Yeah, um, I am going to put, um, let's see if I can find this. Yeah. How to get it's like a lot of people sleep with their nature journals. That is a whole nother level of commitment. Wow. That's there, there's, there's, there's a journal article called the pen is mightier than the keyboard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know that there, you can get um, PDFs of that for free online. I've seen it there before. I'm trying to just do a quick search for that. 
Um, and I'm not seeing it at this point, but they're doing some research on um, advantages of, of longhand note taking over quick tap typing. Yeah. Um, does longhand just mean like writing? Yeah. Like just print or? Uh, it's just you know, writing whatever way you want. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, I even outline draft essays like that because I think just having things exist only in the digital realm, for some reason, it would make it really hard for me to like be attached to them, if that makes any sense. Yeah. There, yeah. There, there's something very, there's something very tangible about, you know, these little notebooks and notes and, and thoughts and ideas. Yeah. Um, hmm. All right, well, um, it is just about lunchtime here on the Pacific Coast, and uh, we'll be wrapping up. Um, I would like to um, uh, thank you, Avea, uh, boop, um, and uh, Kate, thanks so much for sharing that, and Chadwick from Point Blue Conservation Science, and um, everybody here, we really uh, uh, appreciate you being part of this community. I hope that we had some useful strategies to think about what's going on under the hood of some of these great big critters. And um, I uh, also hope that you, um, oh, Eleni, the doodler, let's bring uh, uh, in one more uh, thought or comment. Um, hey there, uh, hold on a second, you can now unmute. I didn't want to interrupt the flow. I just uh, was waving goodbye with the elephant I drew, but I will make a comment. I noticed that the the way you showed us the big old shapes, um, really, really like look at that. It, it's it's got it, it's it's elephant-ish. It is. So, there you go. All right. Thank you. This was oh, great today. That's this really awesome. Cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, also, you will find in the video archive on johnmuirlaws.com, at some point in the past, I did a different class on elephants, and I taught it in a totally different way. And so there's different uh, tri tricks and ideas that you can find in there. Um, thank you all for being here, and I'll uh, see you around the neighborhood. Be kind, everybody. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for creating these spaces, and thank you for being the role model of, of kindness to us. Um, I was going to say thank you for being changed that you wish to see in the world, and then I worried that that was cliche, and then I thought, no, it's actually not. It actually is true. <laughs> so thank you for being the kindness that you wish to see in the world. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best. And the more we practice it, the more we will get better at it. Like um, miles. kindness miles. Yeah. <laughs> so kindness miles. Oh, I like that. I see what you did there. <laughs> Everybody see if you can put in some reps with kindness today. Let's see how that works out. Take care, everyone. Take care.